a pleasant day to all of you. And depending on your time zone, again, it could be good afternoon or good evening. We welcome you to our Communion Sunday today. And as you know, for Communion, we do have a special series that is focused on the book of Hebrews. Because every Communion Sunday, our focus really is on the Lord's table itself. So everything today is really leading us towards the observance of what we call the Lord's Supper or Communion. And so, may I invite you to go back to what we just read together, because I will not beat around the bush. What we've just read together really talks about the situation when following Christ seems too hard, when following Christ seems too hard. And I will also tell you point blank what it is about. What we've just read together, especially verses 26 to 31, are not only the harshest words in the book of Hebrews, they're actually some of the harshest words in the entire Bible. I mean that. From Genesis to Revelation, what we've just read together in Hebrews chapter 6, chapter 10, I'm sorry, especially verses 26 to 31 are some of the harshest, most severe words in the entire Word of God. And why is that? Because friends, he's warning them. Lovingly, not self-righteously, but lovingly. He's warning people he loves about something that could mean life or death literally for them. So, beloved, in words reminiscent, in other words, reminding us of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 8, the writer of Hebrews is actually warning his struggling congregation, telling them, you, you need to hold fast in your faith. You need to never let go of what you have believed in. What does it mean? Well, it means simply some have. Some have left the faith. Some were thinking of leaving the faith. And beloved, because of this very, very important topic, I would like to ask you to just bow your heads with me again. And very quickly, just have a word of prayer with me. Father, we ask you to guide our brief devotional on this section of Hebrews, Father. They might be harsh words, to be honest, Lord. But maybe for someone listening today, it could mean life or death. For someone saying, I'm giving up on all of this Christian thing, it could mean they will stay and realize they really belong to you. And maybe, Father, there is somebody listening today who just realized I have never really come to faith. And today is the day they will do that, Lord. May it be so. We ask that you be glorified in everything that happens, Father. We ask that Jesus Christ be lifted up right now as we talk about him. And how we cannot live life on earth, but especially life after earth apart from Him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A very quick context, friends. Hebrews 10.25 is that famous verse which says, Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves. That's the context of Hebrews 10.26. What does it mean? They were forsaking the assembling of themselves. They had, some of them had stopped gathering. Why? Perhaps because it was not popular to be a Christian. Perhaps because it was to reap persecution to be a Christian. It was difficult at that time, like it is difficult now to be a Christian. And so that's what it means. That's why we said this really reminds us of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 8. Why? Because they talk about the same thing. We call it apostasy, falling away. It's not a pleasant subject. I wish it was not something that we had to dwell on, but we have to because the Word of God is clear on it, friends. And I have to preach on it because we're going to the book of Hebrews paragraph by paragraph. And there are two things I'd like you to remember before I even go further. The first is this. Similar to Hebrews chapter 6, The writer is talking like this because he's not pretending to be omniscient. He's not pretending, look, I know who in the congregation 
who are worshiping with us in the churches over there, I know who are believers or not. He's not saying that. Why? Because he's not God. Only God knows who's really saved or not. And I mean, you cannot go around judging people, but you can be certain about yourselves, even as you're listening to me. My dear online worshipers, you could examine your own hearts and ask yourself, do I really belong to God through Jesus Christ or not? But we cannot go around judging people. That's the situation of the writer of Hebrews. That's why he's going to talk like this in a very similar manner to what he did in Hebrews 6. One more thing. Aside from the fact that the writer is not pretending to be omniscient, especially about the salvation of his uh, listeners or congregation, the second thing is that when the attenders of the Hebrew church were going through difficult times because of Christianity, they had one of two responses, or actually both. One is some departed. The others concealed. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, that's dangerous. When Christianity, when following Christ is too hard, it is dangerous to even think of departing. That's what he's going to say. Or something very similar, to conceal it. So, beloved, this message is for all of us, not just for those who have obviously left. You see, there are people who are still worshiping with us who have not obviously left. They might still be listening online with us, but they're all, they're, there's already at the back of their mind something like, do I really need to keep this up? Is this going to be the story of the rest of my life? Believing in someone I cannot see? Maybe somebody's listening right now saying, if not for my very persistent spouse, I wouldn't be here. I'd be doing something else. Or maybe some kids are saying, If I wasn't just under the strict authority of my parents, I wouldn't even be wasting my time on this. May I say this lovingly? You're in great danger. You're in a lot of danger. If that's what's in your heart. I pray, my dear friends, that when being an unashamed and unafraid follower of Jesus seems too hard, and you're tempted You're tempted to slack off or even permanently go away or walk away. We must be reminded of these truths that we see in the Word of God. As you know, we're going through the book of Hebrews devotionally, so I will not dwell too long on this, but I hope it still makes a significant impression on your heart. First, in verses 26 to 31. When following Christ seems too hard, friends, beware the consequences of falling away. When following Christ seems too hard, beware the consequences of falling away. Look at the warnings. There are three here that we see about falling away. The first is in verses 26 to 28. Leaving what you have believed in. And what's that? Christianity. And the the main object of Christianity is really Jesus Christ. Leaving your faith in Jesus Christ will cost you more than you'll ever know. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because the cost, my friends, is eternal. That's the price of leaving what you have believed in. Look at verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth. Stop there. Go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth. That's the very definition of the condition that we call apostasy or falling away. So I want to dwell a bit on this. That's the very definition. There are three characteristics to apostasy. The first is go on sinning. There is persistence. That's why you cannot call a person who just committed a sin, even if it's a very public, even if it's a very shameful sin, but if the person repents, you cannot say, you've lost your salvation. That's not apostasy. You see, the word here is go on sinning. There is persistence in sin. What else? The second characteristic of apostasy, friends, is here also, deliberately. It's not out of ignorance. It's not a person who says, I didn't know. It's a person who deliberately persists in sinning. And the third one is 
And this is probably the saddest part of apostasy, friends. After receiving the knowledge of the truth. What is that? After being exposed to the gospel. After hearing about Jesus Christ. Friends, apostasy is to persist in sinning. And to persist willfully, deliberately. After hearing the gospel. And that is why the writer of Hebrews is now saying, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Those are sad words. He's saying, you cannot be redeemed. In other words, there is a point of no return. And that's the saddest part of apostasy. There's a point that you cannot go back anymore. There's a line, there's a boundary that when you have crossed it, there's no longer a sacrifice for sins. I've told you this before. I want to say it again. For most of my life, I've always believed every person has a chance to repent and turn to Christ until their last breath. I think that's still mainly true. But to say it's 100% true, 100% of the time is very narrow-minded. You only have to look at the life and teaching of Christ to realize that he was telling the Pharisees who were opposing him that they had committed the unpardonable sin. What was that? To attribute the work of the Holy Spirit to the work of Satan. And he told them, you cannot be forgiven. They were still alive. They were not dying. When he said, what does it mean? You have so hardened yourself against the truth. You can no longer absorb the truth. So friends, there is a time that perhaps God will say, I'll keep giving you chance after chance, after chance. But please, don't go around telling people you will always have this chance until your last breath. Because if you look at this passage, it's not always true. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins for some people who persist in sin, who willfully persist in sin, who after receiving, hearing the gospel, will now say, I'm done. I'm true. I'm walking out. And my friends, look at what it says here. There is no longer a sacrifice. You're beyond redemption. And it goes on to say, there is only a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire. Now, if you love to read what you call commentaries or books of Bible scholars about the Bible, there are some who opine. Uh, these are harsh words. They cannot possibly be words about, you know, believers. I agree with that. God will never say to a believer who has sinned against him that there is a fury of fire that will consume you. So I tend to believe with that viewpoint that says apostasy refers to people who are not believers. And this is found in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 to 9. When we talk about a fury of fire, this is a reference to Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 to 9. Referring to Jesus, it says, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Now you might say, Pastor, shouldn't you speak in love? Beloved, the writer was writing in love. I hope you're not saying I'm we are speaking here self-righteously. I am letting the passage speak for itself. The writer out of love is warning people in his congregation, if you walk away from the church and you plan to walk away for good, even if you haven't physically walked away, but in your heart you're saying, should I keep believing this? He's saying to them, 
You may not be a believer at all. And there might come a point in time that nothing but judgment is awaiting you. This is what it's saying actually in verse 28. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses died without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. What is he talking about? He's saying, look, in the old covenant, in the old testament, whenever somebody committed a capital crime, if there were two or three witnesses to that capital crime, let's say the sixth commandment, you shall not kill. If somebody witnessed you committing murder, that the writer is saying, that's the old covenant, you would be executed on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And he will go on later to say, there are witnesses more powerful than human witnesses when you keep turning your back to the love of God illustrated in Jesus Christ. 1 John 2, 19, friends, is the Apostle John's reflection on those who left the church. 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. This is not a reference to church membership. If you, for example, leave a church, your pastor should not be quoting this to you and saying, you, this is about you. No, this is a reference to apostasy. Don't let anyone misuse these words. This is a reference to professing Christians who said, I have put my faith in Christ, and then they leave the faith for good. They never return. That's 1 John 2.19. So please, don't misunderstand this verse. But leaving what you have believed in will cost you eternity. This is not a reference to losing salvation. May I be clear? This is a reference to people who were never really saved. People thought they were saved. Maybe they even thought, this, the, the people who go into apostasy, they thought they were saved. They were never really saved. And that is what John, uh, what the writer of Hebrews is warning about. What else? The second warning is found in verse 29. Falling away is an offense to every person in the Trinity. Now, that is really, really serious, friend. Look at it. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one? And then he enumerates three things. I, I want to enumerate for you these three things because they're about the Trinity. First, who has trampled underfoot the Son of God. That's so obvious. But I want to point out the word trampled underfoot. If somebody says, I am a Christian. And then this somebody says, I now renounce everything. I turn my back on everything that I used to believe in. The equivalence is, the equivalent is, you are stepping on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're literally, the passage says, trampling him underfoot. That's not a minor offense, friends. That's, what else? He has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. And I believe and I agree here with uh, Dr. John MacArthur's comment on this, that the word he was sanctified here is a reference to the Lord Jesus, not to the person departing from the faith. And so what do you learn here? Who is the person of the Trinity here? It is directly referring to Christ and indirectly by implication referring to the Father. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because covenant, covenant refers to two entities. In a covenant, it's simply, friends, in simpler English, a spiritual agreement. And so when you see here the word covenant, who is the spiritual? Who are the entities in the spiritual agreement? It's God the Father, mankind. And who mediates the covenant? Jesus Christ. And so when it says here, profane the covenant, it means you've actually insulted. You have committed sacrilege against the other party of that supposed covenant. It's God the Father. And thirdly, 
outrage the spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit. Do you see the word outraged here? That's a strong word in the original. It means to stimulate to fury. You're actually making the Holy Spirit extremely angry at you. That's why the word here is outrage. If you have other English translations, it uses another word perhaps, but it should be equally strong. Infuriating, literally, the Holy Spirit of God. So friends, do you see what this is saying? The persons of the Trinity are offended. It's personal to them. When a person has been exposed to the gospel, when a person seemingly has professed faith in Christ, when people think you are a believer, when you also think you are, then you come to that point where you say, I will have nothing to do with this anymore. I'm done with this. I'm over this. I'm through. This is what's coming. This is what we've done. Falling away. It's an offense taken very personally by the Trinity. And third warning is, in verses 30 to 31, God, as the highest judge, carries out his own infallible judgments. You know what the problem with God being the highest judge is? Number one, first, he's infallible. Whatever his judgment is, it's perfect. It cannot be wrong. It cannot be unjust. But that's only part of the problem. You know what the other problem is? The judge doesn't just sentence the guilty. He carries out the sentence himself. And that's the scariest part, my friends. When we, when we go on deliberately sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, the judge whom we have personally offended will now make an infallible judgment. And the same judge will now say, I've sentenced you. Now I am also carrying out your sentence. Look at verse 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine. That's why, beloved, this is not a reference to a Christian. God is never, never vindictive against a Christian. Please let that sink in. God will never say to a Christian, vengeance is mine. You see, there are some Bible scholars who opine. This is actually just the discipline of God. This is God saying to an erring Christian, erring Christian, huh, backslidden Christian, you go back to God. If you don't go back to God, God will say these things to you. Vengeance is mine. No, I don't think so. I believe it's very clear here. These are words that could never be said to a believer. Look at this. The Lord will judge his people in verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. Once you have been received by God into his kingdom, when you put your faith in Christ, the wrath of God is never something that you have to fear. Yes, we might incur the displeasure of God. God might be displeased with us when we as believers sin against him, but not the wrath of God. That is reserved, friends, for those who have never become part of God's kingdom. Because once you're part of God's kingdom, he will never subject you to his wrath. Why? Because on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, the wrath of God poured upon him. I remember the song in Christ alone. Did you know that there was a time that became very controversial in some churches? Because there's a statement there that says, the wrath of God was satisfied. And some churches were saying, every time you sing the song in Christ alone, will you change the words, the wrath of God was satisfied? 
And the original writer of that song said, no, we're not going to change that because that's sound doctrine. He's correct. On the cross, all the wrath of God was poured on Jesus Christ. Friends, this is where I'm leading to. If a person dies rejecting to his last breath, if, you pers- if a person dies rejecting the love of God, There is nothing to expect except the wrath of God. God so loved the world. That is true. The love of God is offered. That is true. But that offer, friends, ends when a person who has claimed to believe in Christ now turns his back on Christ and dies without ever returning to Christ. And the only conclusion is, He was never of Christ. And when you die rejecting the love of God, not all the angels in heaven, not all the devils in hell, even if they work together, can rescue you from the wrath of God. If you reject the love of God offered through Christ, there is nothing ahead except the wrath of God. If you're listening to me today, And you're asking yourself, why are you so negative? I'm not being negative. I'm explaining to you what the passage is saying. The writer is pleading with those who have left or are tempted to leave the Christian faith. There's nothing but judgment ahead. You better rethink leaving your faith in Christ. You better examine yourselves as 2 Corinthians 13, 5 reminds us. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. We better test ourselves. Because friends, if we reject the love of God, there is nothing ahead except the wrath of God. How do you stand before God as I speak to you today? I did not speak like this so that you had a very negative view of God. I want you to see the truth. God did love the world. God did give Jesus Christ that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But if that is not enough for you, can you still blame God? If one day you will stand before him and receive the sentence of an infallible judge, and then the same judge carries out your eternal execution. Beloved, if you're asking yourself, what must I do? I'm pleading with you. If you're listening to me, you're not sure how you stand before God, tell God, tell God, Lord, I'm not sure how I stand before you. But I just heard from this preacher that out of love you gave Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what does that mean? To believe he died on the cross for you. That's what it means to believe in Christ. He died for you. And that you will receive what he did for you. If you will put your trust in Christ and receive what he did for you. Friends, I want you to know, if you mean it, God will take you seriously. And he will forgive you. And you will become a child of God. And when that is done... You're a child of God forever. He will never let go of those who belong to him. So friends, when following Christ seems too hard, beware the consequences of falling away. But after giving such a severe warning in verses 26 to 31, look at what he now says in verses 32 to 34. That's why I told you. The writer of Hebrews loves 
his congregation. It's not out of a smug self-righteousness that he's telling them, I'm warning you, he loves them. He's telling them. He stopped attending church. He, you, you, you might even still be in church, but you want to walk away. Now he's telling them. Look at verse 32. When following Christ seems too hard, look back and see how far you've come. You see, he loves them. Look at what he says. Recall, recall the former days. When after you were enlightened, when, I, when you got saved, you endured a hard struggle with suffering. And then he describes how they endured. He said, some of you were publicly exposed to reproach. Some of you were partners with those who were publicly reproached and afflicted. You had compassion on those in prison. The word there, compassion, isn't just, oh, I have nice feelings. No, the word there is the word from which we get sympathy. You had sympathy implying when they were in prison, you probably visited them, even at the risk of being exposed as another Christian and landing in the same prison. What else? You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. We're told by Bible scholars this is probably a reference to a persecution where those who were identified as Christians were not just arrested. Friends, they lost their homes. So he's telling them, look how well you started. You've been through so much. So when following Christ seems too hard, look back. See how far you've come. You see, it all comes down to this. God would never have let you come this far. God would never have let you survive so much suffering to now just abandon you. If you are really saved, God will hold you fast. After shaking them up spiritually, he now assures them, if you survive suffering in those early days when you were a new believer, do you think God will let you go? If you survive earlier hardships by grace, you can thrive in the next. May I address you? Christian, you had a great start. Don't falter now. You started well. Don't end badly. Whatever it is that might make you want to leave the faith, whatever it is that might tempt you to say, I will have nothing to do anymore with the church or with Christ or with Christianity. There are many reasons. I don't want to go through them because of time. Some of you have different reasons for wanting to leave the faith. Broken relationships, you stumble because of somebody, some church leader. Some false teacher perhaps has convinced you that this is all nonsense. Or maybe it's just neglect. Maybe you just stop going to the Word of God. And now you're tempted to leave it all behind. You started well. Don't end badly. There is benefit in going through your past. It's not all bad to go back to your past. If reviewing my past, if you reviewing your past makes you want to continue following Christ, that's the point of the writer. Look at how far you've gone. Are you going to abandon this all now? Simply because you're you're experiencing hardships? Don't. You started well, he's saying. Don't end badly. And third and last, remember what he said. You think following Christ is too hard? Beware the consequences of apostasy. You think following Christ is too hard? He said, look back and see how far you've come. Third and last, when following Christ seems too hard, the writer is now saying, Look forward. Look forward. He already said look back, remember? Look back to your past. Look at how you started. You started well. You started right. Now he says, one more. Look forward. 
Look forward to its reward. There is a reward. Verse 35. Do not throw away your confidence. What confidence? God confidence. That's another term for faith. Do not throw away your God confidence. Do not throw away your faith. Don't put in the trash can what you believe in. Simply because it's hard to continue being a Christian. Why? Because it has a great reward. Verse 36, you have need of endurance that you may receive what His promise is saying. If you fall away, if you fit the definition of apostasy, you persist in sinning and deliberately after you have been exposed to the gospel, He's saying you're going to lose your reward. It's not just rewards in heaven. The reward of eternal life itself. And that's what verse 37 is saying. Beloved, the writer is simply saying this. There's a reward for faith. So don't falter now. There is a reward for God confidence. There is a blessing for endurance. It will be worth it. And he's now saying, you know, the Lord Jesus may return any time. Or... If, if we end in this life through death, not through rapture, but through death, he's saying, then it's worth it. Whether you, you go to heaven by rapture or by death, it's still worth it. But in the meantime, he said, we walk by faith. Look at verse 38. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back. My soul has no pleasure in him. What is he saying, Pastor? This is what he's saying. Nowhere is the saying truer. It's always too soon to quit than in the Christian's walk with God. If I ever quit walking with God, if you ever quit walking with God, God, that's the biggest mistake you'll ever make in your entire, not just temporary earthly life, in your eternity. Because if you quit for good, if you quit permanently, if you quit and never return, you were never saved. Friends. That's what he says when he says, if he shrinks back, my soul, God said, has no pleasure in him. May I repeat what I have said before. We are not saved because we persist. We cannot save ourselves, nor can we continue saving ourselves. We are not saved because we persist. We persist because we are really saved. That's why verse 39 ends with this. For we are not of those who shrink back. It's referring to departure. We are not those who will go into apostasy because they are destroyed. But we are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. This is the doctrine that we call the perseverance of the saints among the doctrines of grace. Somebody said, That's not exactly accurate. It should be the preservation of salvation, and I agree with that. The perseverance of the saint doesn't refer to our perseverance. Perseverance, it refers to God's preservation of our salvation. We are not saved because we persist. We persist because we are genuinely saved. So I'll end with these thoughts, friends. When following Christ seems too hard. Beware the consequences of falling away. Examine yourselves. Test yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Number two, when following Christ seems too hard, look back. Look back. And then see in the present how far you've come. Are you not going to give up? Are you not going to falter after you started well? And thirdly, When following Christ seems too hard, look forward. There is a reward. This is worth it. 
the suffering is worth it. The sacrifice is worth it. Dying to self is worth it. Denying yourself so you can carry your cross is worth it, my friends. There is a reward. You see, it all goes back to the cross. It all goes back to the cross. The cost of Calvary. The writer is really reminding us. The cost of Calvary should never be taken lightly by those who have been exposed to the gospel. That's why we're doing what you call the communion today. The communion, friends, is a constant reminder. This is the cost of Calvary. If this becomes old to you, if this becomes old news, and you're, you're tired of this, beware. Beware. Examine yourselves. Test yourselves. The cost of Calvary can never be taken lightly. For the way that you regard it at the end of your life is the measure of the genuineness of your conversion. And the strength it gives us to live in the present, friends, is always enough. The communion isn't just a legalistic observation for us, you know. Let's do this. Why? Because the pastor said so. No. Let's do this. Why? Because Jesus said so. It's not just that. We do communion because it's good for us. Jesus mandated it because it's good for me and good for you. The cross gives us strength. The cross of Jesus Christ tells us you can carry your own cross, Christian. The cross of Jesus Christ reminds us you can die to self, Christian. It reminds us you can deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow Christ. That's the value of the communion, friends. It tells us if Jesus was able to do it, he gives us the strength to carry our own cross. And its future reward, the cross of Christ, and carrying our own cross will never be too large. There is a reward. I don't know about you. But just knowing that we'll be with God forever is enough. Maybe some people will have a lot of rewards. I don't know what they look like. Crowns? I don't know. For me, I just want to end up there. I want to see the scars on Jesus' feet. I don't know if I can even look up his face. I just want to see them. I want to see the people who have gone before whom I know are there. That for me is enough. The future reward of living for the cross, by the cross, through the cross, will never be too large. When Christianity seems too hard, you must remember this. You must hold on because you're held. We are not saved because we persist. We persist because we are saved. Those he saves are his delight. We've sung this before. Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. You must hold fast because you are held. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that our perseverance in the faith is not even our own doing. You hold us fast. Lord, if there is anyone online listening who has perhaps been disturbed, shaken, 
rendered anxious by this passage. May it be to their eternal benefit, Lord. If they've been professing faith for years, for months, and now they, they are not certain, let them be humble enough, Lord, to come to Jesus Christ and tell Him their fears and be certain from this day on, from June 6, 2021 onward, that they have put their faith in Christ, in what He did on the cross for them. And they, they never, ever doubt ever again. Lord, for anyone tempted to waver, but they know they are saved, Lord, please let them look back and see how far they've come. Let them look forward, Lord, and realize this is all worth it. Father, may all this just prepare our hearts to worship our Lord Jesus Christ at the Lord's table today. For in His precious name, we ask this and we pray. Amen.